And now we're going to make our journey a little further south and uh, uh, happen to introduce Lisa Schulman Janiger. She'll be talking about the ACSLA Very Well Census and Behave Project. Elisa? See what I can do. So the ACSLA Global Census and Behavior Project is a great example of long-term citizen science going on for quite a long time. I got involved with it back in 1984 when I looked at a project that was being done a couple of weeks, a couple of months a year at Marineland of the Pacific with um, volunteers in Marineland watching gray whales and counting them decided wouldn't this be great to turn this into a full-term project or a full season project and started it back in January of 1984. This particular season we had 110 trained volunteers. Many of them have been with us for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years or more. A lot of our volunteers come from the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, the Whale Watch program, which I was a part of when I and still am. And I'm a, a, um, one of the instructors for that program and got involved with it. A lot of them come from the public who happen to be passing by or in a public area at an interpretive center and get involved. They come by one day and bring binoculars another day and then a chair and then they're part of the project. <laughs> so it's really great. We watch for an average of 12 hours a day, seven days a week, almost six months a year. This past season, our station was open for 174 days. We were there every day, rain or shine. One day we had gale force winds on March 1st and still saw 94 southbound and 94 northbound and 7 southbound gray wells that day. It's amazing. Uh, we put in uh, over 11,000 effort hours. Uh, we, with the experienced people we have, we have 15 core volunteers this year who put in over 200 hours each that sort of anchor different sessions. Perhaps it's Wednesday and Friday morning or every afternoon or Saturday afternoons. And these poor, experienced volunteers put in about 40% of our effort hours. So the history of our Gray Well Census back in the 1970s, members of the American Station Society, LA Chapter, and um, Cabrillo Whale Watch, the early years, would watch from Point Furman of the Palos Verdes Peninsula, right against the LA Harbor area, would talk to passerbys, write down the numbers of Gray Well scene on a chalkboard, which would be erased daily. So unfortunately, we don't have those numbers, but it was a great start with interaction with the public, people getting interested in these whales that came close to shore. In the 1970s, late 1970s, the project was started by Bill Samaras, Laura Osteen, and uh, Marine Land of the Pacific, which is also a great opportunity to enlist new people who would happen to come by the pilot whale tank, where we were located, and uh, help us out, and also educate the public there, too until we got kicked out on February 11, 1987, when they closed unexpectedly. We were also at Catalina Island for a couple of uh, seasons, for partial seasons out there from the west end of Catalina Island County. We got kicked off because we happened to be very close to a bald eagle nest, and it was either the eagles or the whale watchers, plus the roads get washed out and have to hike in and Oh, by the buffalo would knock over our supply tents and, <laughs> and drunk goats and pigs and foxes. The foxes by the campfire who ate our fermented pears were really kind of interesting. Anyway, that was really, really interesting. And it gave us a good bearing on uh, where the whales were going. Are they going back side or front side of Catalina Island? And we actually saw direction changes from the front side to the back side for southbound whales. We saw a lot more whales going um, southbound closer to shore and uh, going southbound offshore and then for the northbound migration you see a, sh a shift closer to shore. 
So we're located across the road. We can see Catalina Island. That's one of our main landmarks there. And we're, from a, a great perspective, about 125 feet above sea level, we can actually spot distant blows with binoculars and spotting scopes out seven, eight miles. We have great observations within three miles or so, a really wide field of view. So we see whales, particularly to the north. We see whales coming into our area. We can track them quite a long time and getting uh, better at uh, estimating counts. That's a big issue is trying to see how many whales you have. They aren't all up at the same time. So we're right on the back patio of the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. And right where you see the arrow, there's our volunteers um, watching where the water uh, cliffs drop off. We also have nearshore canyons. So we get interesting species like some horn whales that can approach within two, three miles of shore, sometimes within half a mile of shore. So we've had over uh, about 20 different marine mammal species, about 15 kinds of cetaceans we see from shore over the years. So our whale spotters educate the public, very diverse background. We have nurses, lawyers, actors, um, all kinds of people, every profession you could think of. We use 7x50 binoculars that um, Noah uses, the same ones, with reticles and built-in compass and spotting scopes to look at the individual whales, determine counts, see if there's really a cow present or not, and identify other species. We do counts, distribution, migratory timing, the timing changes from year to year. For example, the southbound migration has shifted since around 1980. Well, it had shifted about seven to sometimes 10 days later until the last three years, in which there's a sudden shift to earlier migration off here. Very interesting. <laughs> Behavior, uh, calf recruitment, individual ID, when we can get it. Get them coming very close to shore and sometimes not so close. So we've got a gray whale going by, you know, within New York, our uh, whale watchers here. We get whale watching boats. We see interactions with sometimes occasional fishermen, sometimes with boats, jet skis, all kinds of things. So we record it on data sheet, which is entered into our computer. We look at the times, the initial, the transect, and the final time that we see them. But we keep track of where those whales are at all times on a note paper, because we might have multiple sightings out at the same time. So we want to make sure we're not recounting whales. Some spend time, they come across Santa Monica Bay and stop at Point Bassetti, and they could spend a couple hours milling in our area. It's a resting area, it's an area where moms will nurse their calves. There's a lot of interaction going on. So we want to make sure we're not double counting any whales. We're really interested in calf presence. We have seen a lot of southbound calves off our area and also quite a few northbound calves. The cow-calf migration tends to be biased closer to shore. So proportionally wise, we get a good proportion of calves. So it's a good feeling for what's happening with calf recruitment because they tend to hug the coast. So we get good looks at those and also we get looks of the uh, nutritional condition of the mom. Do they look skinny? Are they robust? What's going on with that? Can give us a feeling for uh, what was happening up in the Arctic before they headed down? Did they get enough food? Are they able to feed that calf sufficiently? We know environmental conditions twice hourly, of course, visibility is important, wind conditions. Um, we have fog on parts of about one third of our days. Sometimes it's minor, sometimes it's major. So to take that into account. We've been out there in all sorts of things. Very seldom do we shut down. If it's foggy, we just wait for the fog to lift. We look for identification marks on individuals. We want to see how many different whales there are. As I said, they're not necessarily all showing themselves at the same time. We want to count how many are in each group. So we look for white spots, for knuckle shapes on the back, for any deformities like this is Quasimodo, who I saw off of the LA Harbor uh, a couple days after a marine mammal conference, which I saw her picture. And uh, it was really cool because she was tracked from San Ignacio right before she had a calf right after she had the calf, and then off LA Harbor between February and May. So we got to track her progress using photo identification back in the 80s. Seen a whale that has a big harpoon scar, and there's been at least three of these that I know of. This is massive, massive scar of the either explosive harpoon perhaps that exploded early, or maybe the whale was a little further, it was able to survive that. And quite a few of our whales, at least 25% of them, have a killer whale, two scars on their flukes. 
So that often the evidence in a whale is really rounded flukes or a lot of white scarring on it. And you look through the scopes and binoculars and, and see if there's scars. Okay, behaviors observed. Breaching is something that we see uh, fairly often. We love to see it. The record breacher was a calf who breached 64 times, ran along the cliff, counting them. And that was back in the day of film when I ran out of film. And one of our observers, Jeb Gitsby, handed me a roll of film as we're running and counting. And it was breaching, and there was a sea lions jumping with it. It was amazing. The mother turned around and came back to it to get it. We can actually get identifi identifiable photos from the census when they're in close to shore. The second breach picture is of a gray whale breaching from the census. So although we're 125 feet above the sea level, these whales can come in really close to shore right outside our kelp bed. We see spy hops occasionally uh, in the kelp, but not as much as we see breaching. We see a lot of milling and socializing. Whales spending a lot of time sometimes blowing bubbles, a lot of playing in the kelp, perhaps feeding in the kelp. The kelp has anthropods, which the gray whales feed on. In the substrate, it also has sea slugs and fish and all sorts of stuff in it. So particularly mothers and calves, we see playing kelp a lot, the kelping behavior. We see a lot of species. We also see courtship behavior. We see mating behavior, and we have seen penile displays in December, January, February, March, April, May. So we see, well, they're interested all the time, okay? Um, we doesn't mean that they're conceiving in May, but doesn't mean that they, and I've talked to some other folks too, have seen that in the summertime. Um, they're interested in mating, definitely. We see newborn calves. This particular calf I saw in January. It was a mile and a half off our census project. And we saw it was in foggy. The census couldn't quite see it. And we went, saw a blueprint and stopped and looked. And there was a brand newborn calf who couldn't swim at all. Its flutes were completely folded up. It was just probably minutes old. It kept surfacing upside down. The mother would push it right side up. It, it was just floundering around, absolutely amazing. So that was in January. We've seen, I've seen, I didn't put it up here, but I've seen a couple of placentas off the LA Harbor area, gray whale placentas. Um, the captain would not let me put it on the boat. I wanted to pull up his placenta. I've heard of him, saw pictures, and he said, Are you kidding? That's so gross. But um, Jim Simich isn't very happy about that. He wanted to weigh it, measure it, and all of that. Uh, we, it's difficult to track newborns. Mothers with newborns tend to be lower profile. They often won't have a visible blow. They often won't fluke. So it's tougher to spot them. Often we spot them by the absence of what we see. We'll see fluke prints at the surface marking where the whale is, and we don't see anything else or see a little dark body pop up. So um, the, the behavior, what we see, the tracks are a key that there might be a, a calf present northbound. And we're demonstrative with southbound. It's really tough. We have seen nursing behavior. In fact, this year was a record year for northbound calves. We've seen both in the water. We've seen as many as four cow-calf pairs hanging out together, playing with the babies. Really, really cool. We had 285 northbound calves this season, which is a record for us in 31 seasons. And this is a photo here of calf number um, 285. So it's really exciting to see that. There are issues of problems with our, that whales face around our area. Harassment from boats. There's a gray whale right above the, the yellow writing there. And boats speeding by, not knowing they're there, and sometimes knowing they're there and doing wheelies around them. We see whales with obvious entanglement scars. Uh, there's jet skis in the lower left hand. The gray whale is right about here. Those jet skis went around and around for about 15 minutes, including yep. extremely close to the whale. And we have seen actually whales swim in um, 1985, we had two gray whales go by marine land, dove came up, and only one came up. The other came up a week later in a gillnet. In 1990, gillnet legislation was enacted that um, outlawed gillnets within three miles of shore. And we did talk to some folks about our observations, and they took that into account when figuring how far from shore they should do that, and so on. We've even seen feeding behavior in 1989-90. We have very few coastal gray whales. Very few, 300, 400. Our numbers were extremely low. We had one reliable gray whale, Johnny Paycheck. <laughs> this gray whale was seen for three weeks, a juvenile gray whale. One day we had one gray whale go by. The next day we had one gray whale go by. The third day we noticed there's like a Playboy bunny on that gray whale's loop. Okay, and it, it stuck around for four months. Uh, feeding on, they can feed on cocoa pods, krill, all sorts of stuff. We get skinny gray whales. The ice coverage on feeding grounds determines what's happening 
um, how successful they will be in reproduction. In 1998-99, it was a mass mortality event, very few cats for those two years. And the next year, when the gray whales were recovering, nutritionally wise, there were very few cats too. We had a super pot of at least 23 gray whales one day that was recited off San Diego 18 hours later and matched up the flukes of nine of the 10 flukes. So really interesting traveling three and a half miles an hour. So here's the flukes from here and San Diego and Diane Alps just happened to have this on her laptop and I saw, that's the whale I just saw. Same marks from one day to the other matched to the previous year in San Diego Lagoon. So what are some of the um, overall trends we've been seeing in this time? So our southbound and gray bone counts between uh, 1984 and, 19, and 2014 we have huge ranges. It's going to depend on weather conditions. It depends on the whales that they're ship coming in close to shore or further from shore. It depends upon is it El Nino, La Nina, all sorts of things. The ranges from southbound are 301 to 1301. For northbound, 521 to 3412. These are all raw counts. But you can see how um, the southbound count, if that's a higher southbound, typically mirrors the uh, northbound count. The calf counts, also very interesting. First year that I know, um, that I did the census um, was, was a La Nina year, and we had lots of whales and we were within a mile of shore. I thought this was easy, and then not so much after that. <laughs> okay, calf counts, this last three years have been amazing. If you look um, in around the, two, the mass mortality event, we had uh, gray, at least 40 gray whales washed up along our shore in our area, because my husband Dave had to go check them out. Very few cats, and then the numbers increased. 2010 was the lowest uh, calf counts that the NIMS counted at uh, um, Pigeons Blancas, and 2012 was their highest counts. They didn't have a record year this past year, but they had really, really good counts. <coughs> What's interesting also is the low southbound counts. These three years is the highest Decembers we've ever had. Super high December counts. Early migrating, likely pregnant female. <coughs> Very, very low southbound counts for cows, even though we had ideal viewing conditions. Then look what happened. We had really, really high calf counts going northbound. So I suspect that they uh, got a lot of food up in the Arctic, came down early, uh, were more successful with uh, their calves, and we, we got a big calf push. Really interesting. This year was supposed to also be early access and a lot of food up in the Arctic. So we may have another early migration low southbound count and hopefully a high uh, northbound count. As a proportion of calves to non-calves, you can see it's quite variable over the years. We've had some big years, such as our JJ year up there, that we had six very well southbound calves that washed up alive. That year we had 107 calves, southbound calves. So it's quite variable over the years. Northbound calves, also quite variable. Look at our big years the last three years, quite big. And then looking at our calf percentages. These are the calf percentages for northbound. What percentage of the total population are calves? Quite high the last few years particularly, but up and down over the years. So how does our census season compare from year to year to year? This is a 10-year average. This is what we had this last year. And the previous year. And the previous year. Notice the early migration. And the year before that, which is more typical. And also notice that we tend to have two peaks for northbound. These are the non-calf migration, and four to eight weeks later, the cow-calf migration, which averages about six weeks later. And just a close-up of that, phase A and phase B. So we had 1,214 southbound and 1,741 northbound. And we see a lot of other species, too. We're involved with, um, which I'll go over in just a second, we're involved with Journey North, which is an educational website, sharing our data and interacting with the students. And as is the NIMS project at Pedro's Blancas. We see a lot of interaction with other species, such as Pacific white sided dolphin. We have many other species we see at the census, including um, rhesus dolphin, bottlenose dolphin, fin whales, blue whales, humpback whales, killer whales, minke whales. We have uh, furry folk. We have California sea lions. We have our elephant seal from our whale watch trip yesterday. First seal from our whale watch trip yesterday. All of you should have gone. Okay, we have sea otters. In fact, it's been thought we have like four resident sea otters now in Santa Monica Bay. So I expect the sea otter sightings to increase a bit. Harbor seals almost every day. See northern, um, see a couple of stellar sea lions. 
Common dogfin is we can't tell the difference between long and short beak there. We see them almost every day out of 174 days. We saw them 162 this last year. Bottlenose dolphin, this is all from shore. Bottlenose dolphin, we saw them 147 days this year. Both of those species, most days ever in 31 years. We actually saw a birth of a bottlenose dolphin in 2009, right from the census, 6 o'clock in the morning. We have Pacific white sided dolphin. Numbers go up and down and alternate with the rhesus dolphin. In years that we have lots of white sided, we tend to see few rhesus and vice versa. And it's interesting, there's opposite patterns seems to be up in Monterey Bay, so we suspect they might be shifting up and down the coast. Fin whales, massive increase in fin whales. 107 days out of 174, record year 138. Huge, huge increase in the last five years, fin whales close to shore. Blue whales also close to shore, but not as many. We tend to see blue whales more during the summertime. We have problems with people like paddleboarders going around them. Humpback whales increased the last uh, seven years, and minke whales, they're around all the time, but they're harder to spot because they're very low profile, so they're probably around even more. But in um, the last three years, we've been seeing an increased amount of sighting. Sperm whales, we had one sperm whale, was seen between 1982 uh, and 1991 from our census, sometime with a male companion. Double scoop, a, a small male sperm whale foraging right off our coast. And there's been a sperm whale mango, from 1996 to at least 2013, who's been hanging out and, and was just spotted uh, first day of the census last year. Interesting stuff happening. False killer whales. We see them throughout the years. Last confirmed 14 years ago, very rarely sighted. Had them this year. Pilot whales. Commonly seen. Very, they were the most common ones we saw back in 1984, one of the most common. Last confirmed back in 95, 96 from the census. They were in the area where we didn't see them from the census. Northern right whale dolphin, dolls porpoise. Breedus whales and say whales have been in the area, but they're very difficult to tell from shore from fin whales. There were confirmed Brutus and say whales in the area this year. Uh, killer whales, we've had killer whales uh, almost every year. Um, actually seeing killer whales the first year of the census back January 29, 1984. Got me into deciding, okay, for sure, this is what I want to do for my life figure out who's who, who's coming here. We have seen transients, offshore type killer whales, and LA pod whales, which are most likely the eastern tropical Pacific um, whales that came up for, visited us from one El Nino to the next, which resulted in a uh, catalog of photo-identified individuals co-authored by Nancy Black and Richard Tonello, who are here, that we're working on uh, updating as we speak. And again, different types, ecotypes of killer whales seen. The LA pod was the only killer whales we spotted off the, off the Peninsula area between 1982 and 1990. No other killer whales were spotted but this one group of about 15. That's it. And these are the ones, in fact, that one killed a great white shark off of Farallones in October of 1997. And in December 1997, three of them were seen headed south off La Jolla, never to be seen again. They ate sharks. This is taken right off of Newport Beach. Um, they're very small killer whales, very interesting. Now we can maybe in our area too, so there's other types to look for. Um, lots and lots of acknowledgments of the people who sort of I stand on the shoulders of. Dave Roof, National Fisheries, helping to guide in the protocol of the census. Wayne Perryman, we communicate a lot about the timing of the calves, what are we seeing where, helps us out with killer whale sightings too. And John Kalamakias is out with um, spotting all sorts of critters and we communicate with them and also with our whale watch boats. We talk to the whale watch boats, they go out and they can reconfirm, yes, there's a cat, they can get identification, photo IDs of particular animals. We could not do this project without volunteers. It's totally 100% citizen science. There's dedicated people, dedicated their lives, one woman, 20 years, every afternoon, five days a week, she's there. Wow. And without these citizen scientists, these dedicated people who are fantastic observers, this wouldn't exist. With budget cuts, this couldn't happen in, a, in a, um, a formal scientific study. So it's a fantastic project. I didn't think 31 years ago still be doing it. But I can't imagine ever stopping it. It's amazing. Thanks.